Thanks, Rob. Uh, this morning, uh, Matt and Kristen and Ryan, I believe, are all with Imago Day Church uh, with Daniel and Krista Jansen, one of the churches we got to plant a few years back. They are actually partnering with another church and moving into a new building, which is an incredible day. It's just one of those milestones in the life of a church. And so the Larsons are down there celebrating with them, with some other friends. I wish I could be there, but I'm also equally happy to be with you guys opening up the text this morning. So as you think of uh, Imago Day, Daniel and Krista, if you know them or if you don't know them, be praying for them today. This is one of those marking moments in the life of a church, and we are so excited to be celebrating alongside with them. Uh, it is a joy, though, to be back with you guys uh, and to be opening up the scriptures with you all. It has been quite some time, and I'm excited to be back. I love this passage. I love this text. I love the series that we've been in in Acts. I have been ministered to by it, and I'm excited to open up the word with you guys today. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app, go ahead and open up to the book of Acts, chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And while you're turning there, I just want to set the stage a little bit for where we are and where we've been. Matt mentioned last week uh, that where we are in the book of Acts is sort of this moment where God is breaking open a whole new storyline of the gospel moving beyond Jerusalem and even beyond Judea into this whole ends of the earth thing. And especially the gospel is now going to non-Jewish people. It is breaking outside this historic group of people that God has guided and shepherded over hundreds and thousands of years and is now expanding to the whole world. Because up until this point, the work of Jesus and his spirit through the early church has been largely limited to this Jewish community. And now the whole thing is about to get broken open in a new and exciting and for some a really confounding way. So two things about the text that we are about to read. One is it's really long. <laughs> It's long. It's a long text. I, I read through it this morning again, and it took me like eight, eight and a half minutes to just read through it. So it's a big chunk of Scripture. One of the reasons we're reading such a large portion of Scripture today uh, is because it's just one story. It's a narrative. It's a, it's a little bit of a back and forth with Peter and Cornelius and some other people, but it is one contained story that we wanted to keep together. Second thing you're going to notice about uh, this passage is a few bits of it may feel a little repetitious. So for example, Peter gets this vision and he actually gets it three times. And not only does he get this vision three times, but he's going to tell, we're going to hear about this vision three times as well. And one of the things uh, that is important to note about the Bible is when the Bible repeats itself, when there is something that shows up over and over again, it's like one of those dashboard warning lights, important, important, important. And so even though it may feel a little bit repetitious as we're reading it, it is one of those things that says, hello, stop, pause, consider what is going on right here. And because of the repetitious nature of these visions and the reporting of these visions, one commentator says this might be one of the more important things Luke is trying to communicate in the whole of Acts. So with all that under our belt, go with me to Acts chapter 10, verse 1, and we're going to go all the way to chapter 11, verse 18. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one on the edges, or the text will be behind me on the screen. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter." He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. With the angel, when the angel spoke to him and had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, in Joppa, the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. 
In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had just seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who's well spoken of by the whole Jewish nations, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So we invited them to be his guests. And the next day he arose and went away with them. Some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he had called together his relatives and close friends. And when Peter had entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit with anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send, therefore, to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are his witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead." To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water? for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance, and I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and the birds of the air. 
And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers, right here, these guys, and also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he'd seen the angel stand in the house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household." As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Jesus, we ask that you would lead us and teach us from your word today, empowered by your Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, friends, that was a beefy text. Well done. But I hope you notice what was going on in that story. The main characters back and forth, the repetitious nature. God is trying to communicate something incredibly profound through this story. And last week, we left off with this incredible miracle, the raising of Tabitha to life. So Peter's in in Joppa. It's about 30 miles uh, north of of Caesarea. And he's crashing on Simon the Tanner's couch. And the next scene shifts to Caesarea, the seaport beach town, about 30 miles north. Uh, And this town was really interesting. It was a town that was rebuilt by Herod the Great and named after Caesar Augustus. And it was the center for Roman administration for the province of Palestine. So Palestine, an occupied territory, and this is the Roman outpost, the center for government and administration in this occupied land. And it served as a showpiece, a propaganda machine for Roman culture. And it had a temple dedicated to Caesar. So naturally, the occupied Jews hated Caesarea. They did not like the city one bit. In fact, in the city, Gentiles there outnumbered Jews um, by a huge margin, and there were constant riots and clashes between the two groups in the city. So in the city of Caesarea, you get a a Roman soldier, and he's actually a, a Roman commander in the Roman army, who's been noticed by God in this very particular way. The text calls out some really interesting things about Cornelius. He seems to be very religious. He was a devout man, which means he was recognizably religious by others. He was a God-fearer. He worshipped Israel's God, not the other gods around him. He practiced his piety with his entire household, so wife, kids, servants, anyone else living with him. He generously gave alms, and he prayed to God constantly, which probably means he was observing the fixed hour prayer rhythms of the Jewish religion. So you've got this Roman commander in a very Roman city, in an occupied land, who's worshiping the God of the oppressed of the city he's in. Nothing about this makes sense. This is just how God likes to work. And his vision is basically God saying, I see you. I see you, Cornelius. I see what's going on with you. I'm going to send you Peter. And there's a scholar who picks up on something really interesting. Conrad Gempf says this. He says it's interesting that the angel told Cornelius to send for someone rather than giving him the good news right there and then. God had something in mind for Peter and the church as well as Cornelius and his family. Which means what God was about to do with Cornelius was not just for Cornelius. This is a bigger thing that was going on. 
So Cornelius sends some guys to pick up Peter and bring him back. And the scene shifts back to Joppa where Peter is praying and apparently hungry. And there's a lot to unpack in these couple of verses. In verses 10, uh, chapter 10, 9 through, let's call it 16. There's a lot to unpack there. I'm going to read that text again. And we're going to pick apart a few important things that are going on. The next day as they were on that journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the Jewish, uh, or about the sixth hour to pray. So uh, housetop is like the equivalent of our patio, like back porch. They go up there to pray, and it's the sixth hour of prayer. So he was doing his fixed hour prayer time, and he became hungry because it's around lunchtime and wanted something to eat. They, they, people were preparing it. He fell into this trance, which means he's awake. This is not a nap. So he's awake, he falls into this trance and sees a vision. He sees the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times. Took up three times to understand what was happening here. And the thing was taken up all at once to heaven. Now, to really appreciate the weight of what is happening here, we have to take a little bit of a detour from Acts into the Old Testament. Because this whole clean, unclean thing seems incredibly important and contentious in the life of the early church. There's actually a council convened in a few chapters to deal with this once and for all. And so if we flip back to the Torah, those first five books of the Bible, right in the middle of the Torah is a book we avoid in our Bible reading plans called Leviticus. (laughs) And (laughs) I know, we're going there, guys. All right, so in Leviticus chapter 11, we read something like this, verse 45. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. There's a fascinating kind of pattern throughout Leviticus where all of God's laws are grounded on the work he did for them and who he is. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law about the beast and the bird and every living creature that moves through the waters and every creature that swarms on the ground. This is the summary of all the things they are to eat and not to eat. To make distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the living creatures that may be eaten and the living creature that may not be eaten. And before them is 44 verses of all the things they can and can't eat for these reasons. We get this again in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 dealing with leprosy and skin disease. Uh, And in chapter 15 about, let's just call them discharges from men and women and what that does to the cleanliness of the Israeli camp. This is usually the moment where we like check out of our Bible reading plan. We're like, all right, guys, I I don't know what to do with this one here. But there are a few really actually important things here in Leviticus chapter 11. And I want you to pay attention to three like buzzwords that come up in these couple of verses. Uh, The first buzzword is holy. So be holy as I am holy. This is a repetitious pattern that comes up all over the Old Testament, particularly. But we see it crop up in a few ways in the New Testament as well. Be holy for I am holy. And you can think of these buzzwords in like some concentric circles. So that first one is holy. It literally means unique or special or uncommon. Now, this is really important for us to not necessarily equate to moral purity. This is not good and evil. There may be some of that wrapped into it when you get into some specific application, but the word in and of itself is not dealing with good, bad, evil, good. It's dealing with common, uncommon. It's dealing with something that is special, that is unique. We tend to often think about holiness as describing good or evil. So a decent theological definition of this word would be more like set aside for God's special purposes, which might entail some moral purity etc. But at its root, holiness is about being set aside for something special. Now, if we go out one layer, the next buzzword in that Leviticus 18 text is clean. 
And clean should be the default state for the nation and people of Israel. So through this covenantal relationship with God, the normal status of Israel ought to be clean. So the priesthood was holy. They were set aside, having Yahweh as their heritage for a special, distinct purpose. But the the nation itself functioned in this clean space, where there were some things they should be doing and should not be doing to maintain their purity. And then the final circle out is is unclean. This is the default state of the rest of humanity. Once again, this is not necessarily a good-bad, good-evil situation. This is just defining how God is relating to people in this time. So with those concentric circles, there are a few ways the Israelite people thought about holy, clean, unclean, and a few ways that God prescribed how they're, they're, they're to live into this. The first are around people, like we've already mentioned. The priests are holy. They are set aside for God's special purposes. Even when um, God is giving them the inheritance of the land in the book of Joshua, as they move in and take the land, the Levites are not to get their own, like, land like the rest of the tribes do, because Yahweh is their inheritance. And then clean, we have the people of Israel, and unclean is kind of the, the whole world at large. But these human divisions correspond to three animal divisions as well. The sacrifices and that holy space, God accepts from the pure animals only those who are domesticated, unblemished, and set aside for God. And then you have clean animals, the stuff that the Israelite nation can eat and interact with and all of that. And then you have just the rest of the animals on earth which fall into this unclean category. Gentiles eat all the animals, including from this unclean category. Now, these tripart divisions also have spatial dimensions to them as well. Because God is rooted with the people in a place. And so in the holy place is the tabernacle or the sanctuary, this, this kind of holy place where sacrifices happen and where the priests do their work. And then you have the land at large, the promised land, Israel, and they're eating only pure animals. They're doing it in their land. And then you have the earth, all mankind eating whatever animals they want. Now, once again, not good, evil, not righteous, unrighteous necessarily. There's pieces of that, but the primary definitions here are people that are set apart and ready for God. So I'm going to give you one more chart to help you visualize what is happening here. This chart comes uh, from a guy named Michael Morales in a fantastic book. Uh, If you ever wanted to understand the book of Leviticus, read his book. But he says holy and common are in relation to like the status of a person, place, object, and time. Whereas clean and unclean under that banner of common refer to the condition of a person or a place or an object. So to be clean means to be fit for the presence of God. Well, to be holy means that one belongs to God and is set aside for his special purposes, living for his will alone. So the opposite of holy is common, not evil. Holy common, okay? Everything that is not holy, it by default is common, So common things divide into two groups, clean and unclean. So just for a a quick example, there were throughout the the Torah like uh, pots, pans, special utensils, kind of tools that were used for the tabernacle. A fork or a pot cannot be good or evil, but it can be marked holy or common. There's stuff that was used in the tabernacle for the worship of God that was specially set aside and dedicated for him. And then there's normal pots and pans and forks you use in your tent or in your home. They're not evil forks that you're eating with. They're just forks that have not been set aside for God's special purposes. Now, something cannot be simultaneously holy and common. They're two different categories. And clean things can become holy when they are sanctified. But unclean objects cannot be sanctified until or unless they are cleansed. Clean things can be made unclean if they are polluted. Holy things might be defiled or profaned and become common, even polluted and therefore unclean. Only God can declare something or someone or a place or a time holy. So at this point, you're going, Bert, this is so fascinating. I want more law talk. But what does this have to do with Acts chapter 10? Thank you for that detour with me. Let's go back to Acts chapter 10. And see why Peter is so appalled at this vision from God. In Acts chapter 10, let's go to verse 10. He became hungry. Peter's hungry and wanted something to eat. So there's even a physical connection to what's about to happen in this this vision. 
While they were preparing the food, he fell into this trance and saw the heavens opened up and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. There's nothing to separate or distinguish all of the animals that are on the sheet. So already this is a problem for Peter. All these things are intermixing and in- intermingling, which means everything that is unclean is turning the clean stuff unclean just by proximity. This is a big red flag for Peter. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, eat, kill and eat, or the literal translation is slaughter and eat. So this is not sacrifice stuff. This is food stuff. And this is shocking and offensive to Peter because his response in verse 14 is, by no means, Lord. He tells God, no, this is how disruptive this vision is to Peter's status quo. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. He's never eaten anything unclean, which means he's a good Jew. right? This is the norm, the expectation for the Jewish nation. But that he's never eaten anything common means he's a really good Jew. Not even anything common. This takes an extra effort. This is like a religious level up for Peter. Eating common things, let alone unclean things, would have threatened his standing before a holy God under his theological context. Avoiding unclean food kept him in the Jewish religion and nation. Avoiding common stuff kept him close to God, or so he thought. And this voice from heaven telling him to partake in something that could potentially separate him from Yahweh, I want you to just imagine the trust and the faith there for Peter. Imagine what's being tested in his mind and his heart. Everything about how he knows to relate to God is being challenged. What does he do with that? The voice came to him a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times before it was taken back. God is saying, basically, don't call something common, which in this particular Usage in verse 15 is a catch-all term that means anything not holy. Anything not holy. Profane, common, impure, defiled, unclean. Basically, everything that isn't holy, what I have called clean, don't call common. Don't call something profane, defiled, impure, unclean when God has changed the status and the condition of that thing already. But here's the tension. We just read in Leviticus 11. God has already commanded things about clean, unclean. So what's changed? And the Sunday school answer is? It's Jesus. You're right, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Jesus has changed everything. His death, his resurrection has fundamentally turned this upside down. This stuff was so embedded in Jewish culture and in the early days of Christianity that a council had to be convened to really hash this out once and for all. But the message remained consistent throughout the New Testament that Jesus has accomplished all that was needed to reconcile us to God. Thus, sacrifices, dietary stuff are no longer needed. It's this new covenant stuff that Jesus gets at in Luke chapter 22. At the Last Supper, when he says, take this, this is the bread, this is my body, and he says this, likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is hyper-intentional language from Jesus. This new covenant is superseding what has gone before. It is fulfilling all that the old covenant has had whispers of, or hints of, or teases of, Jesus has brought to fulfillment. So you don't need to do goats and pigeons and stuff at church on Sunday because Jesus has died and brought in a new covenant. So Peter's still working all this out. Like, you you don't do a a theological backflip in one day. He's still inwardly perplexed, the text tells us. He's still sorting out the ramifications for all of this. But then the men from Cornelius show up, 
The Spirit tells him to go with them, so they, he welcomes them into his home to crash for a night. There's this radical hospitality taking place that would have been unheard of. And they go to Caesarea, and as they arrive in Caesarea, Cornelius has expected them, and he's gathered all his friends and family, all of his closest buddies, all of his relatives, people he has influence over. They're all there waiting to hear from this guy. And there are two huge moments in this next section of the text, towards the kind of middle end of chapter 10. Two huge momentous things happen in this narrative as Peter shows up. Number one, he preaches the gospel to them. Contextually, he preaches the gospel to them and proclaims this message of no partiality, which was a huge deal. This lesson he had learned like 24 hours before is now in his preaching circuit. No partiality as the gospel is preached. But secondly, the Holy Spirit immediately falls on everyone listening. So in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, Peter opened up his mouth and said, Truly, I understand God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And he goes on to to preach the gospel, to explain the story of Jesus, to connect Jesus to the laws of old, to tell about how Jesus has disrupted everything and his resurrection has changed everything. And it's this fulfillment that we see in Acts chapter 2, 39, that the gospel is for everybody. Peter himself, at the day of Pentecost, preaches the promises for you, for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Acts chapter 10 is like the beginning of that fulfillment. It's not just for one group of people huddled in one city. This is for everyone, everyone who is far off. And he retells the story of everything that's happened with Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, his commissioning. And then something profound happens. And I love the, I'll just call it Holy Spirit symmetry of it all, that today is Pentecost Sunday. And in our text today, we have a bit of a second Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes to a new group of people. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit interrupted his awesome sermon and fell on all those who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because of the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And then he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to hang out for a few days. The gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. It's shocking, shocking stuff happening here. We don't know if Peter kind of unloaded the full vision to the people that were traveling with him, but those people certainly got the picture when they saw that. This is reinforcing what God had told Peter in that vision, and it's irrefutable proof for everyone in the room that God is here and the message has gone to the Gentiles. Now, this is objectively amazing, right? Just like stories of new faith, baptism, the Holy Spirit. But it's more than just objectively amazing. It's like a hyperlink in the scripture. It's a hyperlink back to the day of Pentecost. It's linking this new movement of the gospel to the Gentiles, to what God did in Acts chapter 2. Remember, Pentecost people were from all over, different countries, nations, languages, and people were hearing the gospel in their own native language. They were speaking in tongues. Now, there's some different theological interpretations of tongues, and there's some different ways tongues get played out throughout the New Testament. But in Acts 2 and Acts 10, it is widely believed that these are known languages of other nations that's happening right here. Now, what is absolutely fascinating is the Spirit coming and people responding by speaking in tongues after conversion does not happen very often in the book of Acts. In fact, it happens twice here in Acts chapter 2. Tongues crop up in other ways and in other spaces, but in response to conversion and the Holy Spirit falling for the first time, this is unique. There are loads of conversion stories in the book of Acts. But this is the only other place where speaking in tongues happens after the conversion, immediately after, as a response. It didn't happen when Paul was converted or when the Ethiopian eunuch was converted. There are numerous times when the Holy Spirit comes on Paul, the apostles, but no speaking in tongues in the same way. So why is this different? 
When we encounter these things in Scripture, we've got to ask, why? What's going on here? What's unique? What is different? And in the most vivid way possible, God was saying there's no language, and therefore there is no culture that is more of an appropriate vehicle for my truth than any other. The gospel and the spirit are available to everyone and anyone. So, for example, in, in Islam, Arabic is the language of, of God. The Quran can't be translated, so you must learn that language to interact with the holy text. But at Pentecost, God was saying something very, very different. Christianity is utterly different in that sense. Christianity is saying that on the day of Pentecost, every language is equal and every culture is equal. There's no one culture that is more appropriate for the gospel than some other culture. Racial superiority has to end, cultural superiority has to end, and the Holy Spirit's job is to come into each and every culture and recreate Christianity in that culture. So one theologian says, no culture has a leg up on any other when it comes to the gospel. Now, if that's making you any kind of uncomfortable, know that you're not alone, because in chapter 11, it made the early church quite uncomfortable. Peter heads back to Jerusalem, word gets back about what is going on with the Gentiles here, and he was getting criticized from this internal sect of Christianity. This is not the whole of the early church. This is one particular group of people within the church. You know, by then the church was thousands and thousands of people. So you had a few others who were holding on to the idea that to become a full Christian, you had to also adopt all the Jewish customs, uh, dietary laws, etc. And so the subgroup of Jewish Christians who very much thought that all converts had to follow the Mosaic laws, their first reaction to the gospel going to a new group of people, criticism. Their priority was their pet theological thing. And anything that violated that thing must be wrong overall. And we see here just an example of the real danger of elevating a secondary or even tertiary theological issue to prime time. You can probably fill in the gap, especially if you've hung around church at any length, at any point in your life, what those things might be. At different times in history, the church has wrestled around things like the gifts of the Spirit, how and why, women in different roles and leadership, church governance as a whole, philosophy of ministry stuff. Now, these aren't unimportant things to be thinking through, but we can be blinded by them. And so the question we must ask ourselves do we criticize the way or how a new group or a new generation is interacting with the gospel? When you hear about the gospel going to this new group or to someone younger than you or going to a new place or a new culture, is your first thought, yes, amen? Or is your first thought, ah, they're not doing it right? Or they're missing something. Ah, they don't have the full picture. And these theological issues are not unimportant, but they do take a back seat to whatever God wants to do. Verse 17 in chapter 11 is key for us here. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? I don't know about you, but as I was interacting with this text this week, that line, like, just pierced something in me. Who am I to stand in God's way? Because they're doing it differently than I like. Because they don't don't find themselves in the same little theological camp I do. Because I'm annoyed by it. I I don't know if I should tell this story or not. It may get in trouble, and this may not come back to the 11 a.m., all right? But I was uh, in a worship night a little while back, and um, I'm like, you know, like a relatively charismatic guy. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit, and, you know, we try to do this well. Uh, But I was in this, like, worship night. I'm sitting, you know, where I normally sit, kind of in the front row, and there's this very, very sweet lady who is doing the flag thing, right? I don't know if you've ever been in a prayer night or worship night where the flags are going. Not like the American flag, but just like, you know, ribbons and stuff. And she's going at it. I'm like, cool, cool. You're you're doing your thing. And then at one point I get hit with the flag. (laughs) And I'm like now anti-flags, right? Because I I get hit. (laughs) 
That's so silly. But it's one of those areas that like just a little subtle bias came in. And so if I see a flag coming out of the side of my rear view mirror, I'm like moving it three steps to the left because I don't want to get hit by this thing. I'm like, yeah, sure, the Holy Spirit's here, but not like in that way. So <laughs> such a little thing. But I, I think all of us can maybe think of some bigger things, some things that feel more important. Who am I to stand in God's way? If God wants to do the flag thing with this lady, who am I to stand in God's way? I was standing in her way, but not in God's way. (laughs) Verse 18, though, is one of those really powerful responses. Really powerful. Because I think as we're reading thus far in chapter 11, when news gets back to this church, we're like, yeah, this is like Pharisees 2.0. You get him, Peter. But something different happens than with the Pharisees. We see Jesus and the disciples interacting with the Pharisees, and they're often missing the point and getting hung up on their thing. But something different happens in verse 18 that is so profound. When they heard these things, they fell silent. They glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life, which is like a full 180 situation. I'm wrong. You're right. We're not going to stand in God's way. He's clearly doing something. This is the power of a changed mind from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables a kind of humility to change your mind when you're confronted by something God is doing. Stubbornness, as a reminder, is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So here's what happened. We have this useful template for you and I. They fall silent. There's like a humility, a listening that's taking place. They're not waiting for a pause in the conversation so they can then retort with their, their comeback. They stop. They fall silent. They listen. And they glorify God. They worship. They have a perspective change. They recognize, here's what worship does. It recognizes who is the true authority. Spoiler, it's not you. They glorify God. They recognize who the real gatekeeper is of theological do's and don'ts. And third, they realign themselves. They fall silent, they glorify God, they realign themselves. They are changed. They have a changed worldview. The preferences are adjusted, they're transformed, and there may be personal agendas are realigned to the work of God. They say, okay, God's clearly doing this. I used to think this. Which one am I going to fight for? And they, and they bent towards the work of God. It's a long narrative. It's a long story, but it's a theologically profound one on so many levels. First and foremost, the move of God is not exclusive to one ethnicity, race, or culture. It is this multi-ethnic global thing. And God is going to move in different ways with different people. And it may make you uncomfortable. There is this powerful fulfillment to Jesus' final commission and his promise to his disciples in Acts chapter 1. That you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Jerusalem, same place, same culture. Judea, wider place, but same culture. Samaria, wider place, but new culture. And ends of the earth, every place and every culture. God kindly invites Peter to experience a shift in the advancement of the gospel. This stretched Peter's personal understanding. It stretched the early church, this understanding of how God was to interact with his people. So as we're considering what to do with this, um, I, I think there are maybe three things we can process together. And uh, I don't know if all three are for you, or maybe there's one that the Holy Spirit is particularly highlighting for you. But as we get ready to lead into a time of response, there are three things here um, that might be helpful for us. Number one is spiritual activity can set the table for what God wants to say. If you caught in the story that these visions from God came to Peter and Cornelius while they were doing their normal prayer thing. This wasn't like a special prayer meeting. Uh, It was just a normal, fixed hour, regular rhythm of prayer. There's power in those daily devotions, those quiet times, those times in scripture, times in prayer. And so this question I'm asking is, how are we setting the table for God to speak? 
We know God speaks in these whispers as the world around us shouts at us. So how are we creating space to hear from God? Because the re- here's the reality. When we pray, God speaks. As we're setting out distractions, pausing from them, and setting aside time to be with God in Scripture and prayer and silence and solitude, it's often in those moments He speaks the clearest. And what seems apparent in Scripture uh, is that God will break through whenever He wants. You remember the story of a talking donkey? Man, if you're new to church, wait to get to that story. (laughs) But if we're seeking to hear from God, a vibrant prayer life is a way to set the table for God to speak. This is not manipulating or controlling, but just making space in our busy lives. There's this great quote from an old Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, that goes, uh, when I pray, coincidences happen, and when I don't, they don't. Just one of those quotes that weasels its way into my mind. The second thing I think we can wrestle with today is that spiritual activity can get in the way of what God wants to say. Is our spiritual activity a means to an end or an end in and of itself? This was a roadblock for a certain group of early Christians. It was certainly a critique Jesus had for the Pharisees. You're doing a lot of the right stuff, but you're very much missing the point and missing the heart of God. We know that busyness is this enemy of spiritual growth, but spiritual busyness is a bit more deceptive because we have the appearance of doing these right things. This is why it's so important that Cornelius, a very religious guy, needs to get saved. He's doing these great things, praying these great prayers, being generous and all this stuff. And God says, I've seen all these good works. I've seen your devotion, but now you need the gospel and my spirit. And the last thing, the third thing we can maybe think through, wrestle with today, is that God will challenge your preconceived notions and ideas about what he is on about. Whatever box that you've thrown God in, he will challenge that box. Whether it's a cultural ethnic bias, like what's happening here in the text, a certain preference for something like worship or kids ministry or evangelism or whatever, God is on about his thing and we are invited to leave our agendas behind and join him in his work. What might God be challenging you with? Is there someone in your life right now that you inadvertently treat as unclean or untouchable or someone you shouldn't associate with? Are there any behaviors in your life that need to change due to the reality that God wants to reach all nations and all people groups with the gospel of Jesus? Is there a particular preference you need to leave behind for the sake of a new generation interacting and engaging with the gospel? Is repentance needed? A change in thinking, behavior, a change in loves or priorities? I think so my encouragement is let's follow the lead of that early church meeting to fall silent and listen to what God might be saying, to glorify God and trust that his ways are better and higher than ours, and to realign and actually bend our life and patterns and ways of thinking around his. I'm going to invite the the band to come up as we respond, but I want to leave you with uh, a line in the Psalms that I came across a couple of days ago in my morning reading time. Psalm 119, verses 59 and 60. The psalmist says, When I think on my ways... I turn my feet to your testimonies. I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I think that's the invitation I have for us as we respond and consider how the Holy Spirit might be leading us today. Consider your ways and turn your feet to his testimonies. Go ahead and stand with me. I would love to pray for you as we respond. Jesus, as we sit in the magnitude of what you have done and how it has fundamentally changed everything, we confess we are not exempt from that change. 
that as your gospel comes to and through us, we know your Holy Spirit will change us and bend us to be more like you. As we respond and offer ourselves as living sacrifices, ready and willing to give our whole selves to you. We enjoy the fruit of the gospel. It says, because of the love of the Father, the work of the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be invited to surrender the whole of our lives to what you are doing in and through us. Amen. As we sing here, the communion table is open. At any point, come and receive, remember, and thank Jesus for this work of bringing us into the family. There's some buckets for communion, uh, so for offering as well, and some people on either side of the room who'd love to pray and process and encourage you in the gospel today.